Okay, so at the end of the last episode, we'd reached the age where I was about 19 or 20 years old, and several things converged at once for me around that time. The first thing was that I began to feel quite isolated from all of my friends. When you're young, Christian kids and non-Christian kids look very similar in terms of their interests. In fact, they look almost exactly the same. But as you begin to get older, your paths begin diverging. So all my friends had started partying and drinking and going to bars, and I began feeling like I didn't really understand their journey anymore. I felt isolated from them, I didn't understand their interests or even half the things that they were talking about a lot of the time at that age. Now around that same time, my church also collapsed. The church I'd been going to since about the age of eight years old. Now that church had been doing great things and it meant a lot to me. I was really invested in it. It was in the red light district of the city by the harbour and as we would go into it in the evenings there would literally be prostitutes walking up and down outside the door about 10 yards away. But we'd go out and invite those prostitutes in and they were coming into the church and they were being saved. We had drug dealers and thieves and alcoholics. We even had a murderer called Alan who came in and he hadn't been caught yet but he found Jesus and he handed himself into the police and he would thereafter write letters to us from prison. And my dad was a policeman, so he knew all of these people and it became a standing joke that he'd arrested half of the church because they were all alcoholics and addicts and things like that. But they were coming in and they were being saved and having their lives completely transformed. So on Sunday mornings, there could be a row of people and it would literally be a middle class family here and then a couple of ex prostitutes there and then a thief and then an alcoholic and then another middle class family. And we'd all be together as one. And there was no division amongst us. There were great friendships and great fun. And that church grew from about 30 people when we first arrived to about 450 people within just a few years. And we had such hope about where it was all going to go in those days. We kept on talking about taking the whole city and we believed it because we'd seen so many people being saved already. We'd seen God work in such miraculous ways. But then the whole thing just collapsed. And afterwards, I felt a sense of frustration with God. We weren't supposed to lose. The enemy wasn't supposed to win. We were doing such great things. How could God let this all fall apart? I was so invested in that church and I wasn't ready to let it go. And yet it fell apart. So age 19, I'm feeling isolated from my friends. My church is now collapsed. I'm frustrated with God. And the music I'm listening to is gradually getting a bit darker and I'm becoming more inured to the worst elements of it. For example, maybe I don't mute the chorus of I am the resurrection the next time. Maybe I do buy that Ash album, even though it's got song titles like Won't Be Saved and Evil Eye on it. Maybe I do ignore my conscience about these things going forward. That's kind of where I was around that age of 1920. Now also around this time, I'd left school and I'd started university and I also had a part-time job at Costco Wholesale. And because of the isolation and the church falling apart and the frustration with God, I began thinking, how can I tell my non-Christian friends from all of these places that their way in life is worse than mine, when they seem to be having a great time right now with all of this alcohol and partying, and I'm just not. They would come into uni or into Costco absolutely raving about the night they just had and how they drunk so much that they were sick and they hadn't made it home because they'd fallen asleep behind a bush and now they have this awful headache, but isn't it great? I just didn't understand that. That just didn't sound like a good time to me at all. But they seem to be loving this. Meanwhile, I was feeling isolated and alone and my church had just collapsed and there'd been a lot of fallout from that. I was frustrated with God and there was all this stress and infighting. And under those circumstances, how could I tell them that my way was better? So at that point, I began what I regarded to be a social experiment. I decided I would go out with them to the bars and the clubs to see what this was all about. I never stopped thinking of myself as being a Christian, but to be honest, I was quite far from God at that point. I began partying. I wasn't going to church anymore. And although I fully didn't see this at the time, I was frustrated with God. And that was definitely playing a role in my decision making at that point. Now, during this period, my Christian parents were obviously looking on quite worried about the path that I was taking in life. It was causing a bit of friction when I would get home late in the early mornings. 
I began looking to move out at that point as a result and to rent a place of my own. And around that time, a girl from Costco was having the same ideas and she suggested, why don't we get a place together? Now I can hear the groans from people and you're absolutely right to groan. We weren't going out and there was no suggestion of anything romantic, but having a Christian upbringing, I knew this was just not a good idea and I knew the risks and what could happen. My conscience told me not to do it. However, because of the place that I was in at that point, I ignored my conscience and I said, sure, let's look for something together. I told my parents about this plan. They were obviously really worried about what could happen and the choices. I was kind of going off the rails at this point. And whenever I say that, people often say, you weren't really going off the rails though, because I didn't smoke. I hate smoking. I think it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. I never took drugs. I hate tattoos. I never slept with anyone outside of marriage. I was just going to bars and drinking and staying out late. But I was off the rails really. In my heart, I was far from God. Now maybe others have gone off the rails further than that, but I was far from God and I was on the verge of making a big decision that I knew was wrong deep down. And my parents could see the dangers and they felt that they knew what this girl was really up to and what her end game really was. But ultimately, I was about 20 or 21 years old. I was an adult. There was only so much that they could do at that point. Now, this is the part of the story that everyone seems to remember. I think I originally told this story back in 2012, I think probably in the original Stay Free series. And people have often mentioned this back to me over the years. So I guess it sticks in people's minds and you might have heard this part of the story before actually. But my parents were getting very worried about the direction that my life was taking. And they believed that the music that I was listening to was having some role in this. They believed that it was affecting my thoughts, that it was clouding my judgment, and that there may even be a spiritual foothold that the enemy had in my life through this music that I was absorbing. Therefore, one evening, my mom was in the shower when she felt God saying to her, go and anoint Mark's room with oil and pray around it. She then got out of the shower to find my dad who was in the living room and said, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I think God just told me to anoint Mark's room with oil and to pray around it. At which point my dad produced a vial of oil and said, you're not crazy. I think God has just told me to do exactly the same thing. I was just waiting for you to go to bed. So that evening, completely unbeknownst to me, they both anointed my room with oil and they prayed around it. Now, I did not know that any of this had happened. I didn't find out about this for many years, but I must have been out that night. But I do remember that whereas I'd been quite positive about this idea of moving in with this girl from work up into a certain point, I woke up one morning and I suddenly had a complete change of heart about it. I came to my senses and I suddenly realized what an atrocious idea this was. It had the potential to ruin my life. I suddenly decided, no, I'm not doing that. I told the girl the deal was off. She was furious with me as I remember, but I really felt like I'd done the right thing and I had a sense of clarity all of a sudden. Now that was also around the time I came to my senses about the music that I'd been listening to. That was when I looked at the fact I had this Nirvana CD in my possession and thought, what on earth did you get this for? That was when I began to feel my conscience coming back alive, I guess you could say, becoming sensitive again about the lyrics that I'd been listening to and the things that I'd been doing about the partying and all of that kind of stuff. And this is when I began thinking, what are you gonna be in life? What do you want to stand for? Do you wanna stand for this, this garbage? Or do you wanna stand for something more? You could say that at that point, the music wars began. Now this happened over many, many months. I initially threw out some of my CDs, but not all of them. I threw out the harder ones like Nirvana, but I kept the ones that I really loved, like the Beatles and Oasis and Stone Roses and those kind of ones, because as daft as it seems, I loved this music so much that I thought my life would just be unbearably diminished and dull without it. I really did. I was addicted to this music. I thought I needed this music in my life. But as I kept on responding to my conscience, I knew that I needed to break the hold that it had over my life. So eventually I did reach this point where I decided to throw them all out. Every CD that I'd ever owned, it was all gone. until a little while later when I decided I was missing it too much and so I rebought some of it again. It was a battle that went on for many, many months, feeling convicted and feeling passionately that if I was gonna follow Jesus, I needed to break the hold of this music and the polluting nature of it on my mind and soul. And then feeling like I needed this music and that it wasn't really that bad and you know, I could still listen to it and it wouldn't affect me too much. 
Now I find that over time I got stronger as I wrestled with it until about the age of 21 or 22 when I finally threw everything out for the last time and it felt so good and I remember that my room felt lighter and airy and brighter somehow that day and I knew I'd done the right thing and the war was finally won. And it was from that moment that after descending for many years into darkness, I began ascending out the other side. I started thinking clearly again from that moment. My conscience began functioning properly again from that moment. I went back to church and ideas for the fuel project even began developing and forming as early as that. And I decided I wanted to give my life to the pursuit of God and to the pursuit of something that really mattered. Slowly, the light replaced the darkness and clarity replaced the confusion. And it was only some years later that I was in my old bedroom and the way the sun was shining on the wall that day, it was just catching this oily cross that I'd never seen before. I mean, it was invisible normally, but it was just the way the sun was shining on it. In that moment, I saw this cross. It was next to the door. And I remember I went to my parents and said, there's an oily cross on my wall. What's that all about? And that's when they revealed that they had anointed my room that day, way back a few years before. And from that moment, things in my life had started really changing. I tell this story because I genuinely believe that what you watch and listen to can have a sanctifying or corrupting effect on your life. It can aid your Christian walk, but it can also hinder it too. What you allow into your life can have a positive or negative impact on your relationship with God and therefore on your life as a whole. And I've got personal experience of this. In Joshua 7, we read the story of how Israel was being thwarted in their attempts to secure their land because God in that moment had turned away from them in anger. Why? Because a man called Achan had taken things into the camp that were set apart for destruction. God said, you will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. In Deuteronomy, we also read, the camp must be holy for the Lord your God moves around in your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies. He must not see any shameful thing among you or he will turn away from you. I guess it's different now because we don't tend to have these physical objects like CDs or DVDs in our homes anymore, in the main. Although I guess vinyl has made a comeback recently. But in New Testament terms, the camp in which God lives through his Holy Spirit is actually us. It's our own bodies. First Corinthians says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. So God lives within us. So I think the message here is, are we inviting any shameful things into ourselves that would hinder our relationship with God through his Holy Spirit? What are we welcoming into our camp, into our souls? What are we entertaining ourselves with? What are we absorbing on purpose that is dishonoring to God? If there's something that you welcome into your camp, into your soul that is shameful to God, there can be very real consequences on our relationship with him and therefore on the outcome of our lives as a whole. Now, as I make this video, spring is in the air. So now's a great time to assess this and to do a spring clean of any spiritual junk that we are bringing into our lives.